Hello, Algeta. Thank you so much for joining us here on Sportsin. I hope you did go out over the weekend to show support for your local teams and all competitions. We've done that at our end as well and actually caught up with some finals netball action over at the Rita Flynn Indoor Courts on Sunday. Bradley, you've been busy as well over the last few days. Of course, uh, a busy few days, of course, um, starting from the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, some football action, of course, uh, grand final at Sogeri, which was interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. um, also, the governor's uh, Lakatoi Challenge, was the, which was the first, um, happening at the Port Mosby Records Club uh, over the two days, Saturday mm -hmm. and Sunday. Not forgetting the Rugby Union. Oh, yes. Very own women Good taking. turnout. Yep. A healthy crowd, of course, right. to support the women's game. That's awesome. What else do we have in store? Okay, apart from those stories, in the lineup, we bring you an update of PNG athletes going through qualifiers, this time lifters Dikatoa and Moria Baru, taking out gold at the Australian Open in Canberra, Australia. Also, triathlete Rachel Sapiri James runs us through her routine training post pregnancy in preparation for the Continentals, which is an Olympic qualifier. Those stories and more in the next hour. All right, before moving right along, let's take a look at the scoreline this week. Netball now. The private company's corporate netball finals unfolded at the Rita Flynn Indoor Courts on Sunday here in Port Mosby. Various companies made sure they were not to be missed upon entry at the courts. All day. All day. Thirty-two teams turned up in respective colourful attires for this was the finals and everyone went in like a winner. In fact, the much-anticipated match of the day was the Premier Division final between More Printing and Westpac. While Westpac took every opportunity to feed their shooter who towers comfortably over their opponent, more printing placed PNG International Neri Adula right where she needs to be. The first quarter saw both sides still finding the footing, although both cruised to a 9-7 scoreline in favour of more printing. Second quarter saw more still in front on 16 and the red and whites down by three when the halftime buzzer went. The heat turned up in the second half, although Westpac recorded 19 this time, with the blue and white still ahead by two points. At full time, it would be more printing walking away from this 2019-2020 season with the title on 30 points to 21. Ladies and gentlemen, that's been a wonderful grand final. 
The Division 1 final, on the other hand, saw a strong competition with Hodava taking on Post Korea. And again, a neck and neck match it was, although Post Korea was trailing by four points to Hodava's San in second half. And with momentum in the second half, every score had a response, leaving them at 13 flat at full time. An extra 10 minutes later, Post Korea pulled through in a one point margin win in a 19 18 final score. And the winner be Post Korea! And in Division 2, NSL Team 1 came out on top over Pacific Industries, with Division 3 seeing Caveman Constructions walking away winners over Decani 16 10. And it would be SP Brewery who took on DHL in a match that proved to be one that the green and gold side would walk away from victors with an 11-9 final scoreline in Division 6. In Division 5 final, it was a close one between NCD Team 1 and ABT who went head-to-head -head bringing the scoreline to 7 flat at half-time. By full time, ABT failed to level up as NCD1 took the title on 15 points to 14. Meanwhile, BNBM got outdone by BSP in Division 4, 20 points to 16. There you have it. Congratulations to More Printing for taking out the Premier Division title for the 2019-2020 season for private companies' netball competition. We'll go for a break now, and on the other side, Sports Scene continues. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching Sports Scene. The PNG Women's Rugby Union International Cassowaries have gone down fighting against a spirited Tongan team at the Baba Park in Port Moresby. The score, Cassowaries 24, Tonga 36. There was an obvious size difference going into the Reaper Charge match against Tonga, yet the PNG Cassowaries were out to play for pride on home soil. It was an evenly contested match on points. In the scrum, the bigger Tongan pack dominating the play. some space for the big hits Tonga muscling up in front PNG making them pay in singles A late try to the Tongan sealed the victory 36-24. This, this one is very big for us, um, especially for Tongan women. Well, not only for Tonga, but us Pacific women. It will be, um, it's a privilege to play here, especially in PNG. And um, can't wait for the future. It was a very physical, uh, physical game today, but um, by the look of the crowd, everyone enjoyed it, and um, it's just growing for us women. And I encourage um, all everyone to keep supporting us women. We can do what um, you guys can do, you men. Um, very exciting for the future of um, women's rugby. We've, like I, like I've always been saying over the last couple of months, it's a progressive thing for us. Uh, we're, we're working our systems, and you can see after today. 
Uh, we got we went we went to the second phase for the first time in three years. The first time in three years we went to the second phase, and not only that, we went beyond that. So a lot of good things have been happening over the last. We learned a lot in Fiji in November, and we we're, we're picking up. It was a pity that we had to start early this year, but uh, as we go along, it's progressing. We'll probably see a little bit more in the few months to come. We were expecting a win. Um, we trained hard enough. You could see the results, how way the girls played. We could have we could have won. The bounce of the bowling go sometimes our way. No, I'm not going to complain too much about it. One team's got to win, one team's got to lose. But, uh, Tonga made use of their chances and they got it through. That's all. Uh, at this point in time, the ladies will be going into uh, the high performance training, training for the next six months. So this is the first time. They haven't, they haven't gone into high performance training as yet. So uh, we'll be pulling all our players together, about, uh, about a 40 man squad. And then all, all players will go into a six, six month training program. Basically to strengthen everything and we go as we go along. But yeah, preparing only for November. Uh, hopefully we can have something between them. Some updates from Rugby League and PNG's 2019 semi-professional league champions Lay Snacks Tigers are champions of the Melanesian Club Challenge. Tigers trashed Ravravo Rebitos 32 points to 8 in Fiji. The Melanesian Cup is played between countries' semi-professional league winners and Fiji Vodafone Cup winners since 2016. Now, still on Rugby League, more updates from the PNG RFL's end. Um, AGM is happening tomorrow. Sandy Saka is going in with his seat up for elections. Bradley, you spoke to him earlier. How is he looking at this? Well, Sandy Saka has been in that seat for the last two terms, mm -hmm. six years to be exact. Um, he took office when, you know, uh, rugby league was at a limbo. Yeah. And look at it now. At, at, at the stage at rug, as, as uh, rugby league is right now, mm. is, is testament to his mm. achievement. Not mm -hmm. only will uh, uh, Saka's seat be available, but also the directors of the confederates right. as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting times uh, for, for rugby league, of course. Um, I had the privilege of speaking with Sandy Saka, mm -hmm. and here are some of the of his career highlights in the last two terms. The PNG RFL chairman spoke of the reforms undertaken during his tenure. There have been uh, you know, a few milestones that I'm uh, proud of since I, uh, I became chairman in December 2013 after uh, Don Fox handed over the reins. Uh, the last uh, six years has been uh, the We've, I feel we've done, a, we've, we've made a lot of progress in the sports. Uh, as I mentioned about the 2020 years, uh, key things come to mind. Uh, first thing is the governance reforms we've undertaken. Uh, we've brought a bit more stability, uh, credibility and integrity uh, to the PNG RFL and our processes, basically. So to, we, we've had to do that to have the support and confidence of the government, the private sector and our partners who, who invest a lot of money and without whose support we wouldn't be able to, we would not have been able to achieve much of what we've achieved. He also spoke of the partners who have always stood by in good and bad times so that the code's programs are sustained at all levels. I would like to think feeding up the stability is the number of partners, long-term partners and supporters that We've been, the game has been able to maintain. Uh, having good partners, uh, you know, too numerous to name, but having them sign on for multiple years gives us uh, the stability and uh, gives us the confidence to plan for the long term. Tomorrow, the rugby league administrators will decide who becomes the next chairman for the country's number one sport. The nominations for the candidates were announced last week. There are two uh, nominations, nominees for the portion of the chairman of the PNG Rugby League. Number one, Brown Munema was nominated by Romney Killapat uh, from Hiri East. He was seconded by Joe Wakwa, chairman of Is Iso Pusa, in the Gulf province. And then Second is the incumbent, Dr. Nick, Dr. Dr. Nai Powell, president of Potosi Rugby League, nominating Chairman Sandy Saka, and seconded by Adrian Chow, president of Lee Rugby League. 
So those are the two nominees. Whether Taka returns or not, it will be an interesting one. Like the code's popularity, the board comes under public scrutiny many times. It's a good that the sport is popular and it's played by all, but on the flip side of it, uh, because the sport comes under a lot of scrutiny, so those of us who are you know, on the board and on the administration are under as much scrutiny as our leaders in government and business. So what that does is it also scares away good people that can become involved. You know, our good Papua New Guineans uh, of standing who could become, come on the board or come and work for PNG RFL uh, are too, uh, are, you know, are too afraid to come and put themselves under this kind of scrutiny and they're not getting paid for it. Most of us are volunteers. We do it for the love of the game, but the scrutiny that the sport gets uh, chases a lot of good people away and that's a challenge we need to develop, uh, address as we talk about succession planning finding the next chairman that's going to come and take over, finding the next CEO, finding the next director, finding the next coach Michael Maroon, finding, you know, the next Paul Wani referee. All these things require success and planning and investing in the next generation and the next group of people. Rugby League is at a pivotal point as it stares down the next decade. Growth and sustainability of the sport will depend on a visionary yet committed lot to make the sport relevant current and worthwhile for both the leisure and elite or professional. Yeah, look, if Sandy Saka retains the seat tomorrow, all the better for PNG RFL. But if someone new steps in, then let's hope more great things are yet to come. We'll go for a break now. Coming up next, Tokyo 2020. Don't touch the dial. Welcome back. You're watching Sports Scene. It is now exactly 141 days to the Tokyo 2020 Olympics and our weightlifters Deka Toa and Morebaru have just taken out gold medal at the Australian Open in the quest for the Olympics last week. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Tokyo 2020 segment. Dikatoa is now nearing another historical moment where she looks to make a five-time appearance at the Olympics and becoming the first female lifter in the world to do so. Her gold medal performance last Friday at the Australian Open Weightlifting Championship in the 49kg category, lifting a total of 165kg, only reiterates her dominance and pushes her one step closer to Tokyo 2020. Meanwhile, fellow lifter Moria Baru proved to be taking the quest for Tokyo 2020 seriously as he lifted a total of 280 kgs to take out gold in the men's 61 kg category. With this under their belts, they both now prepare for one more competition to make sure they take the platform at the Olympics. And that is the Ocean Championship, which is a gold event that will be happening on April 21st to 26th in Nauru. Triathlete Rachel Sapiri James is now back in training ahead of the Continentals, which is also an Olympic qualifier. Now, unlike previous preparations for other events, Rachel this time is bouncing back from pregnancy. We caught up with her to find out what her training regime entails.
challenging. <laughs> Very challenging because you're not just thinking about yourself now, you have to plan around baby and family and yeah, so, so feeding Bubba and everything revolves around Bubs and um, rest recovery. It's been eight months since Rachel underwent an emergency caesarean giving birth to her baby and she is now back in full-on training and rehabilitation at the Taurama Aquatic Centre here in Port Mosby. With the Oceania Continental Cup Championship coming up next month, she has already put in at least four months of the hard yards to get race ready. The triathlete admits the bounce back has not been easy. Coming back post-pregnancy has been a pretty hard process, but I've been working with high performance to help me get back through rehab. So we did a lot of initially uh, core work to re-strengthen my core and stability work alongside rebuilding the muscle strength that I needed for swim to bike to run. Um, Post-pregnancy, the body, women's bodies go through a lot of change and the healing process of that has been a little bit longer than what would be a natural birth to then bounce back. But um, we've had to work safely at, at it but consistently so I've been doing three strength conditioning um, sessions with high performance every week Monday Wednesday Friday we started that late last year um, yeah and it's been good it's been a good progression but initially at when I first started it was tough it was very tough and I just had to keep telling myself it's going to get better, we're going to get that strength back and working with high performance and my trainer Wendy Albert, it's been fantastic. A lot of support and encouragement, which helps. While it is a challenge to get back to her form from the 2018 Commonwealth Games, Rachel is going to have a shot at the Olympic qualifiers. And there's a couple of um, qualifying pathways. So firstly, we're looking at all the Oceania Cup races in our region. And at the moment, my first race that I'm preparing for is the Oceania Continental Cup Championships. Um, this is early April on the Gold Coast. And it's a very competitive major regional race. All the top elite athletes from Australia, New Zealand will pretty much fill the field. And usually myself um, representing Pacific um, Islands. But hopefully we see some more other girls from Oceania Pacific Islands having a go this year as well as alongside myself. Originally my coach had um, earmarked a Zimbabwe African Cup because it's a pretty good chance for me to qualify and collect points. Um, not so competitive as Oceania. However, due to the budget and uh, coronavirus risk, we said oh, musky and I pulled out of that one committing to that race this year but hopefully I'll look towards that race maybe in the next year and have a go but um, basically we're just going to concentrate on all the races in the Oceania region and maybe look at Southeast Asia if I can get a race or two there. For now the triathlete says she is feeling 80% at her peak and working to get there. Oh, feeling fantastic, feeling almost back to normal again, my you know, pre-pregnancy self, feeling strong. You know, I can get in the pool and swim my old sets at the similar speed and yeah, just feeling great and you know, I have high performance to thank for working with me and you know, high performance does a good job for our elite athletes that come in and train preparing. There's a lot of Tokyo athletes that come in alongside myself, the candidates and yeah. She continues her three to four hours of training sessions every second day and will take on the first race come next month. For me, for triathlon, because it's such a strenuous um, sport with strenuous training, recovery is a big, um, big part of the process. And we have our training, we have our nutrition, but sleep is one of the most important things for that recovery to be able to train continuously hard to get to our, our pre-race um, preparation. 
Uh, for me, sleep deprivation has been a big... <laughs> but we just, we just roll with it and I listen to my body and yeah. Just have to be a lot more flexible with baby. Yeah, but also having family support and having someone being able to take care of baby for me while I can come away and train as help. help. James from PNG Triathlon, and you're watching Sports Scene. And before we head out for a few short messages, guess what? Rosalie Noma has just secured Papua New Guinea's second sport at the Olympics by finishing second in the women's one-person dinghy, that's in sailing. She did so by competing at the Women's 2020 World Championship in Melbourne over the weekend. Congratulations, Rosalie. She now joins her brother, Teraki, in the confirmed list of PNG representatives for Tokyo 2020. Welcome back, you're watching Sports Scene. Great to have your company. Over to the Port Mosby Records Club and the Festival Governor's Corporate Lakatoy Challenge ended on a high note as the two-day event drew interest from the city. As a fundraising drive to support the junior teams in the upcoming regional meet, it was also an awareness drive for the NGOs to advocate against violence and injustice. The inaugural Lakatoy Challenge drew a healthy crowd to the Port Mosby Records Club. The corporate challenge saw a total of 24 teams take part in tennis and squash respectively, also engaging with the NGOs to promote positive messages. I think for tennis and squash, uh it's been a sport that's been played quietly and uh, haven't been a really good support coming um, from NCDC, but I think for the first time, Governor has sponsored 20,000 kina towards this sport and is really very supportive now, recognizing the game itself and also the team has been representing Papua New Guinea as well in overseas in the Pacific Games as well, so Governor has come on board strongly to support tennis. So. We are, as part of the administration, we are also um, supporting as well, uh, Governor's Call as well to support this, but we are also creating awareness in terms of gender-based violence. So that is what the family, NCD Family Sexual Violence is doing as well to um, support this worthy cause as well. The two-day tournament was to raise funds for the juniors to travel for upcoming tournaments. It has been a really wonderful two days um, of tennis and squash. Um, the kids are actually uh, on tour to Tennis kids to Vanuatu and the squash kids uh, will be going to um, Gold Coast in Australia. And um, we've had a really wonderful time with NCDC coming forward as a major sponsor in this event. I'm actually quite quite happy and quite pleased that there is a, there is a lot of support from the, from, the, from the corporate bodies who are supporting the tennis and squash juniors. Um, Family PNG, World Vision, NCDC office, even um, lawyers coming out, giving up their free time to come and help spread the spread the awareness on gender-based violence. Um, it's a first for the club to be connected to gender-based violence. Um, so it, it was it was a little bit slow for the for the players to go and visit the stalls, but I think through the second day, I think people un understood what what what, what gender-based violence is and what they can do to help their own communities or families. In total with all the companies that have put in registrations, we were able to raise over 22,000 kina for our, for our juniors. Yes, we've got other partners that come on board as well. Uh, we've got good sponsorship, uh, 10 in tennis and 14 in squash. Um, on the tennis side of things, it's looking really good. We've got parents who are really supporting this course. And there's, uh, there's about 11 kids who are actually uh, touring Vanuatu to play in the Western Pacific uh, qualifier. So the biggest tournament where, where our juniors will be going to is the World Juniors Championships that will be held in Gold Coast. Um, that we're sending our best juniors and uh, that the moment is 
Josh Potter will be going, Christopher Whitchurch and Amitya Lokos. Um, that will be going to represent PNG in the World Junior Championships in July. The Port Mosby Records Club has a great program lined up for this year. Um, from this tournament, definitely, there has been heaps of interest. So um, it's a great, it was a great event to introduce tennis and squash. Um, it was also an event that, that, that brought in more people to the Port Mosby Rackets Club. Um, that's what we want to see. We want to see more people coming into our club, enjoying our facilities, enjoying our, our world international standard courts, I would say. Uh, um, and, and they're quite happy to come back. So we've, we've increased memberships for this weekend increase um, interest and um, hopefully we increase more support for our juniors. We'll go for a break now and sports in continues when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching sports in. Welcome back. The Sogeri Township Soccer Association kept off a successful 2019-2020 season with its grand final over the weekend. Congratulations to Sogeri Choice in the women's and Koki Park for the men's. Rainy conditions didn't dampen a determined finish to the 2019-2020 season for the Sogeri Township Soccer Association. The showdown in the men's went down to the wire, filled with drama on the muddy and slippery surface. The entertaining finish left the crowd maintaining constant support on the corner. Locked at one all, Koki Park in green and Madinumu in grey went to the penalty shootout. After brilliant saves from Koki's keeper and goals to his counterpart, the men in green kept off a 4-2 victory. The captain was a satisfied man. Yes, I am a team don't play the game. I am a challenging game. I am play. No. I take. Thank you, Lord. Boys, me. Soccer is known as rugby zone, but when Soccer Association started, I have seen raw talents. And today, they have shown the talent today that they are also soccer players, not only rugby. So it's a bonus for the players that they can both represent in rugby and in soccer also. Koyaris can represent uh, the country in the future. In the women's earlier grand final match, Sogeri Choice beat Yarrowari 1 0. 10 or leads for 20 percent on our play now. Okarima, economic spin off comes at. On Mama and our community come market, like I'm not going to disturb us, come up, tourists flood in. Because on the other end, when you see Sogeri is a tourism icon. That's why we are creating this initiative. Uh, lately, no got all sponsors chip in, but we talk thank you straight to Korolo, President Blomina, as we said, our coordinators Blomilo, successful, successfully making this live event to come up. Dream come true for me, for seeing the youth and mothers especially taking part in sports. And I have to say thank you to all the sponsors because, because of their behaviors and etc. The game has ended successfully. And I'm the happiest man on the ground with my executives for giving their time to us supporting this association to run a successful uh, competition. The association plans to start off the next season early. The small money that I got from the club's registration, I have to put back to them and then we will start off a new competition. But after two months time, so we have a very big plan to appease the PNGFA. So there are two interests there, that's our PMSA and NCDC, Public Service Local Associations. So we will, uh, with my executives will meet and which one that they will select, we will affiliate with them so that uh, we can involve in the um, and in future uh, competitions in Southern Region so that so the Township Soccer Association can be part and parcel of that competition so that I can now market my players to the NSL and for PNG. Now, in the last episode, we set sight on the topic sports anti-doping. One of the main reasons for putting forward this topic is the looming Tokyo 2020 Olympics. PNG in-country educator for anti-doping, Asiani Vagi, joined us to discuss the topic. Asiani is involved with the curriculum development for anti-doping in the Pacific that is currently being developed by the Oceania Regional Anti-Doping Organization. And we took a look at three aspects of sports anti-doping. What it is, how important it is to abide by world anti-doping rules and regulations and what is currently available to PNG sporting bodies as well as sportsmen and women. 
While efforts have been made to educate elite athletes and officials, a lot is yet to be done to educate the majority of Papua New Guinea sports men and women. While finances or that lack of may be argued as one or possibly the major factor, the International Convention for the Elimination of Doping in Sports was ratified by Papua New Guinea government in 2009, which means PNG Sports Anti-Doping Organization short for is PNG Sado can apply for funding to UNESCO for its programs or activities. Here's the question. Do you think facilities and utilities should be made readily available for sports and developing programs in the country? This is still open for discussion. Please do join our discussion on Facebook Sports In page and we will review the topic in our next episode. Doping in sports is not only substance, it could be methods also, um, say, the use of IV, use of um, needles, that's prohibited in sports also. And anti-doping basically is the fight against um, performance enhancement methods and substances. But um, doping in sports was identified and before, before that, so together with the International Olympic Committee, they set up the Well Anti-Doping Agency. Um, in PNG, the Papua New Guinea Sports Anti-Doping Organization was established in the 2000s. Um, and, and so that's the body that, that take, carries out the awareness and the missions for anti-doping. How important is it to stick to um, the regulations, I mean, for, well, not only for athletes, but for the team as a whole, um, when an athlete is about to be tested? Um, and what, what sort of consequences do they face when they don't undergo tests or avoid being tested? Right, so the, the athlete is responsible to undergo the testing. But they have their rights also, their rights and their responsibilities. So the one responsibility is to do the testing, carry out the testing, provide that sample. One of their, some of their rights, are if they have, if they have a media, a press, press um, event, then they can, they can do that before going to the doping station. Con um, doping station, if they have a ceremony, like a medal ceremony, then that can wait, the testing can wait, they can attend that and then do the test. Or if they can, if they have warm downs to do after training or after an event, they can, they can be allowed to do that before going to the doping control station. But if the athlete refuses, then that is already a rule violation, anti-doping rule violation. What what are some consequences that some athletes have faced before? Some consequences the athletes have faced before have been, been banned from participation at, at an event, a sanctioned event, or association with, with a coach that has been banned. So we have the programs, uh, we, we run sessions with our athletes. There, we also encourage athletes through through the national federations, the team managers, to um, to get the athletes and also officials do the online course um, provided by by WADA, Well Anti-Doping Agency. It's um, so we share the link with with the sports, with the federations, and um, we encourage them to then share with the with the athletes. Now, at this point, would you say um, facilities and utilities for sports anti-doping is readily available to sports federations or even athletes nationwide? Um, not quite. Yeah, because okay. I haven't, um, I haven't seen the facilities in other provinces because mm -hmm. we've done testing, testing yeah. here. Yeah, but I understand um, at the PNG Games, there's. Um, there's some awareness, or the previous PNG games, mm -hmm. there was some awareness done on antidoping. Yeah, do join us for the discussions on Facebook on the topic that was just posted. Now, don't go away, you're watching Sports In more after the break.
Welcome back to watching Sports Scene. Dini, exciting times for uh, sport over the weekend as well. We will be out on the fields mm, at the right. Kira Kira Ogo T20 uh, cricket competition. We've been following that for the last 11 weeks. So yeah. uh, that grand final is a must, much yeah. wa must watch. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. for you viewers as well, please do follow the Team PNG um, Facebook page and check out where our athletes are in terms of um, qualification processes for Tokyo 2020. All right, apart from that, let's take a look at what else is coming up this weekend. Yeah, well, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our show. This way, we say goodbye, but do join us next week, same time, same place, for another sportsing episode. Now, if you'd like us to feature any of your stories or you have an amazing event that you'd like us to cover, email us on sports at emtv.com.pg or message us on Facebook, on our Facebook page. Also, call us on 312-9200 or you can drop by at our office, Level 2, Garden City. And of course, don't forget, also engage with us on social media, Facebook, that is, That's for right. our Have Your Say topic for this week. That's Sports and Doping. Yeah. I'm Bradley Valenaki. I'm Dino Strykov. Great Good to night. have your company. Good night now. Coming up next week.